Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for joining me, everyone. You know how much I appreciate your time. With me today is Mary Moreland. She is the author of The Gap Between. It is a conversation about loving and caring and supporting people with Alzheimer's, but she especially addresses the sandwich generation because that's where she lived. And Mary is an attorney by trade. So, you know, she had a tough, tough mountain to climb with caring for children and her mom and being a lawyer and writing a book. So thanks for joining me, Mary. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what uh, encouraged you to write the book? Okay. Well, as you mentioned, um, I'm an attorney by trade and I have been for about 25 years, although currently I'm in a business role. I'm a mother of two who, when my mother, when I overtook her caregiving responsibilities were six and eight, but now they're a lot older, <laughs> they're like, you know, 19 and 17. Uh, and I'm also a single parent, which I have been for quite some time. And the reason why I wrote the book really was because when I was going through the journey with my mother, I kind of bumbled around a lot and it was hard to sort of find resources that I needed. And a lot of times after the fact, I thought, oh man, if I had thought about that beforehand, I would have planned for it. So my intent in writing the book was really just to transfer that knowledge uh, to other people to hopefully help them. And, um, you know, I, I hope that it is helpful. Um, and that it saves people some time. And I tried to write it in a conversational tone, um, kind of an informal tone. I want people to pick it up and feel like I have a friend here, like Mary's been through this, you know, and the book is organized uh, by a memoir section, mm -hmm. which explains the real life experience with my mother and how we overcame certain challenges, like taking away the car keys or you know, um, you know, finding different types of care and, and things like that. Uh, and it's divided by topic, legal documentation, of course, um, end of life care, finding care, talking to children about Alzheimer's, really topics that I thought would be helpful for others. Then there's a research tip section, um, kind of summarizing resources about that chapter from different sources. And in between chapters, I've included my mother's poems. There's one of her poems in between chapters. She was a very talented poet. And I did that because I thought the juxtaposition of this really thoughtful poetry next to the memoir section about her, you know, losing her cognitive abilities, I thought that was really powerful because you have a window, not just into what she was like during her dementia, but into what her mind was like before she became ill. Um, so there's a little bit about the book. Well, I agree. So the book is really easy to read and it's definitely, you know, some of them are a little bit too how to kind of like, here's how they find resources and how to deal with this. So I've, I very much enjoyed the ju juxtaposition between the memoir and the, hey, here's what I learned and I'm sharing it with you because that is kind of what I try to do with this show. I was in a similar position to you, although my daughter was 25 at the time when my dad died and I re assumed responsibility for my mom. It was like, holy crud, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And this was in 2017, which... There was a lot, it was a lot harder to find resources then. And you're, you're going back like what to about 2012, 2013. Yeah. When you 20, took over? 2012. And, and I think you're absolutely right. There are a lot more resources now. Um, during that time, it was really a challenge to find resources. And I had no idea where to look, to be honest. I mean, I went to the Alzheimer's Association website and that was very helpful 
but I don't think I really use the website in a helpful way. I was very focused on what stage of the disease is my mother in, you know, like what's going to happen here. Uh, whereas I think, well, especially now the Alzheimer's association has so many different things that can help you. Um, but then I think there were things that I didn't take advantage of because I didn't really know what to ask. And I thought I knew what caregiving was going to be like because my father was mom's caregiver till he passed away. And we had discussed kind of in general strokes of here's what it should look like. Here's what we feel like is important to us as a family. But that kind of very general overview, I don't think really prepares you for just all the things that you have to be thinking of when you're caring for someone with dementia. And I think you need to be part attorney, part doctor, uh, part, you know, activities director, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm missing a whole bunch of things, but everybody listening knows what I'm talking about. And society just sort of expects, it's like, it's your parent, it's your spouse, you know, maybe it's a grandmother or an aunt, but it's just, it's like, of course you are going to take care of them. And then they don't help. One of the best things that people can access through the Alzheimer's Association is their savvy caregiver, savvy caregiver training. And I unfortunately wait, didn't know about it until 2019. I took that in the spring of 2019. My mom passed away March 31st, 2020. So by the time I took it, it was like, well, this information would have been really useful to know 10 years ago, five years ago. Um, it still helped because by the time I took it, I was doing the show. And so it gave me a lot more insights. But, you know, even at that time, people were still hesitant to share their experiences with loved ones on social media. And that all changed a lot between 2019 and now. And the, the thing that I try to tell people is, you know, what you're getting from other people's journeys on social media is great. But I talk to people who don't spend their life on social media. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of them, I don't see most of my guests on social media. So this is, to me, is like a really nice balance. So one of your biggest challenges after you assumed responsibility for your mom was having to explain why she acted strangely after the death of your dad. And that was obviously an additional challenge. Did you feel unable to grieve fully your dad's passing? Because you immediately had this very large responsibility. I know I did. I had about 48 hours and then it was everybody else's needs. Yes. No, that's so true. And, you know, just going back to what you were saying a few minutes ago, we as a family made a conscious decision not to tell anyone about my mother's dementia. And we were very protective of her because we were concerned about that stigma. You know, and I think that we're chipping away at that stigma, you know, but I think it still exists. And it's also a reason why people don't want to tell their doctors that they're having, you know, memory issues, whereas that would be really helpful, you know, to know. So after my father passed away and we had been kind of protecting, you know, my mother, people came over to our house and they wanted to talk to her and express their condolences and I later realized when I did kind of a medical inventory, I got the list of all her prescriptions from her doctor and then compared it to what she was taking. And it was all messed up. You know, she didn't have any of the right medications. So she was extra loopy. And so people would sit and, you know, ask like really easy questions, like, I'm sorry for your loss or, you know, just kind of basic statements that one would expect. And she had not really comprehended that her husband of 50 years had passed away because, you know, she was off of her regular schedule. You know, she was probably very tired because after he passed away, I didn't know where, you know, it's like, well, she can't really spend the night in the house by herself. So I took her home with me, which I'm sure was very disorienting. And so since we hadn't told anyone, these family friends who hadn't seen her for a while were very alarmed. And I got a lot of phone calls after the fact of, you know, Mary, I think maybe you need to make an appointment 
for your doc, you know, for your mother at the doctor. Mary, I think something might be going on with your mother, you know? And so it, it was like an additional, now I'm telling people about mom's Alzheimer's in addition to trying to grieve my father. So like you said, it was just a lot at once. And like you, I felt like I'm just kind of on adrenaline. You know, there's so many things that need to get done. Uh, there's so many things to think about. And, you know, when you're working and a loved one dies, you take some time off. But, you know, at, at least in my kind of job, you don't take a month off. You know, you take a finite, like maybe a week off to make arrangements. Um, so there was just a lot of pressure during that time period. And people would say, what can I do for you? You know, after I would say, well, we didn't tell people this, but mom was actually diagnosed with Alzheimer's, you know, a few months ago. And I would always say, I'm fine. I've got it. Because I think that's the nature of a caregiver, don't you? Or a lot of us. When we don't know what we need. Yes. We don't want to be a burden to our friends and family and neighbors. So, you know, we just... It, and in the beginning, and this is not necessarily maybe for you and I, because we had to take over in the, my, with my mom, she was in the later stages, but it's like, you know, in the beginning, it's not that hard. You make adjustments, you know, mentally it's more challenging than I think it is physically. And so you do got it. And then the next thing, you know, life moves on, the kids need things, mom needs things, a job, you know, and you're like drowning. And now it's like, uh, can somebody throw me a rope? And people are like, rope, what rope? We don't know. What do you mean rope? <laughs> it's like, huh? What do you mean? I don't know if I have a rope. And it's just like, you, what I always tell people to do in an early way, you know, when they get a diagnosis, like your mom did is to make a list of all of all the tasks you have to do today. And then all the tasks you have to do this week, all the tasks that need to be done monthly, and then just keep adding all the responsibilities that it requires to run your household, manage the children, manage the person you're caring for, managing yourself, maintaining your job. You can just writing all that down is exhausting. And then make a list of everybody you know. They do not have to be local. And then, then this is the key point. Write down what you think they are best suited to. Like apparently you would probably be the person I'd write down. Like she can review contracts or any kind of legal stuff. I read that and it's like, huh? You know, cause I am an <laughs> entrepreneur and an artist and please do not ask me to call people any place that is going to put me on hold. It gives me freaking anxiety and drives me straight up the wall. My husband was a banker for 20 years. He's a real estate broker. He's worked, he worked during the 2008 housing crash when being on hold was like life for him. And the only way to get business done, and he can be on hold for two hours, doesn't tweak him at all. But man, it makes me crazy. You need some cookies, some meals, a drive someplace, walk the dogs. I'm your girl. So now you've got a list of things that need to be done, people who might be able to help you do them. So when Mary comes by and says, oh, my goodness, I'm so sorry about your dad. And, you know, now I'm learning about your mom. Um, is there anything I could do to help? You have an answer instead of, oh, no, it's fine. I got because you don't got it. Yeah. And can I add something to your list? Because Definitely. you and I, I think are a lot alike because the first thing, when I had a moment to myself, finally, that's the first thing I did. I didn't think of assigning names to the task. So that would have been good. But I, I do this in pretty much every area of my life, a do delegate delay or dump, you know, because a lot of things on your list, you don't have to do right now you know, or maybe they're not really that important. And the other thing you said that really resonated with me is think about things that people are good at. Because for a long, long time, I mean, I took care of my mom for about eight years. I was frustrated because out-of-town relatives weren't doing this or out-of-town relatives weren't doing that. Or my sibling isn't, you know, I would expect him to be doing X, Y, Z, and he wasn't. But then finally it clicked. You have to meet those people where they are. And just like you said, what are they good at? So for my out of town relative, you know, it became apparent who's very good at research. Um, so I could say, look, we're going to have to move mom, I think. So could you go ahead and research some places where maybe she could go? 
um, for another relative, you know, he didn't like, I, I would think, why aren't you coming over to visit? You know, just come over to visit, spend time. But he just, that just wasn't really his jam, I guess people say now, but he loved going to church every Sunday. And he really enjoyed picking her up on the way to church and going to church and going out to lunch. And it was just once we kind of found something that sort of fit with his schedule, um, you know, it, it kind of all started making more sense and it was more helpful. But I love your idea. And I'm going to add to my do delegate, delay or dump list, like the name of someone who can do certain things. And that's the delegate side. It, it helps too, because, you know, all of us are busy. All of us have, you know, 15 things, you know, I've got multiple projects going on right now and it's like juggle, juggle, juggle. That's just normal life. And if you ask somebody to do something that, yeah, they could do it. Yeah. I could call the insurance company as the doctor. I really don't want to, I didn't want to do it for my mom. I don't want to do it for myself, <laughs> but if you really needed me to, I could probably do it, but God, I really wouldn't want to. So now I feel kind of roped in. It's like, it's not a positive feeling. So if you um, you know, if you find something that like, you know, you said the, the relative, you know, picked mom up to take her to church and took her out to lunch. I mean, that's like, that's like a good chunk of the day, at least half of a day. It's a great chunk of a day. Yeah. And that gives you time. Like you're not dealing with somebody that's visiting within your home. You know, you've got Sunday to do whatever the heck you need or want, hopefully just relaxing and, you know, taking care of yourself was what you did, but that's a, you know, that's actually better for everybody because mom was getting out, she's getting socialization, she's getting different stimulation and it was easy for him. And he didn't feel like he was getting sucked in. And yeah. that's, I think what a lot of, I don't think it's conscious so much is like, well, I want to help, but I don't, you know, it's like, you don't want the drowning person to drown you too. Is kind of the. Right. Cause everyone has so many commitments these days. And, you know, in doing research for my, for my book, I ask people, how did you get a break? Like, what are some things that that you did? Because for me, my mother is probably one of the incredibly rare people who had a long-term care insurance policy. And she bought it right when they started coming out. And so it had all these benefits that there's no way you could get those benefits now. So we were really fortunate that we had that. But I know a lot of people you know, most, almost everyone doesn't have that resource. And they're surprised to find out that, you know, Medicare doesn't pay for a lot. I mean, pays for a little, you know, and the things that it pays for in terms of care is it's very specific. Um, so one thing I found a mobile dentist, I don't, mm. I live in a large city. So you know, maybe you don't have those in a smaller town, but that was very helpful because the dentist was used to treating people with dementia. And so uh, that was helpful. A friend of mine said she found a bath lady who was covered by her insurance. Oh, that's cool. And who came to the house like once a week or so. But she said that was a really nice break for her. And then physical therapy my mother went through physical therapy a number of times uh, and that was covered by her Medicare, which I know everybody's insurance is, you know, different because you have different add-ons to your Medicare, but that was, you know, that was another idea. Um, and then there are all different types of, you know, adult daycares now or things at churches for people with dementia. Now, having said that, I tried all those things with my mother at first because I was very worried about the social stimulation aspect and she hated all of them. <laughs> I mean, she was like, <laughs> you know, I mean, she told, we visited the daycare place and I called them beforehand and said, could mom teach a writing class? Because there were all these people there who were working, uh, but they really weren't working. Uh, right you know, that was just kind of their purpose. And they said, sure, you know, she could come and read some of her poetry, or she could talk about writing, or we could have a writing class, that might be a good thing to have anyway, people could journal, you know, and she told me writing was an independent activity. 
<laughs> and then during our meeting, she said, you know, writing is an independent activity. And then on the way out to the car, she said, Mayor, I do not belong there. <laughs> and I was they thinking, all say that. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I'm really sorry that you'd probably really enjoy it. And then she went to one mixer where uh, the organizer thought it would be fun to wear funny hats. No, oh, and that was yeah. just not her. You know, yeah, that's not me either. Right. So that was just it for that. No more. Like I'd love to make the funny hat, but. Yeah, that I feel weird wearing it, which is silly. And my mom was really, so when my, my dad ended up in the hospital for 32 days and in that time, my mother was at my house. She was at my sister's house. My sister had school age children and her in-laws lived there. So that was a huge, you know, just one more thing too many. And then my aunt, my mom's youngest sister, well, the youngest sibling um, would go to my mom, my parents' house and, and be with my mom. And it did not take very long to realize mom did not respect me as, you know, in charge of the household that would also be in charge of her. And I was like, there is no way this hell in hell this woman can come live with me because one or both of us will be dead by the end of the week. Now, <laughs> thankfully, we had resources. We, my parents' house was paid for. We rented that out. So I lived, lived in the San Francisco Bay Area. Now I live in the Sierra Foothills. The... um the rent covered almost all of the memory care plus her social security. And then the financial planner um, deposited money from their investment accounts into her, into the trust account. And she had plenty of money, which was my biggest fear because when, when you observe what's going on in memory care, a lot of people run out of money at the time their loved one needs just like yes, the most yes. care. Or and so that's scary. Yeah. Or people budget, you know, for that big monthly fee that covers their food and their room and board. But then there are a lot of additional expenses, just, you know, underwear and personal supplies. And, you know, I can't tell you for a while how many times on a Sunday night I was grabbing my kids and like going to the grocery store because we had run out of this or we had run out of that. Uh, and then I eventually, I tried a lot of different things. I tried Amazon subscriptions, for example, because I'm like, okay, maybe that'll save me some time. They'll just come automatically. I know what she needs. But at this point, she was in assisted living. And I don't know where those supplies went, you know? <laughs> I would they grow legs. Go, right? <laughs> And look for them. Uh, and then I ended up finding, and this is such a genius idea, I thought, for a business. Um, this lady in town and her small business was she went to care facilities and she did inventory for you. And she had different packages that you could purchase. And that was very reasonable. She wasn't charging a huge amount of money. But I actually think I spent less money then because you know, we knew exactly what she needed. We knew exactly how, how much more, you know, she had. Um, so that was helpful. And, you know, and I wanted to ask you, did you ever talk to a social worker? Because now after the fact, I've learned how valuable social workers are. No, and I probably should have one on the show because I'm not sure. I'm even out of like, like up to 300 episodes nearly. I don't think I've ever had one on the show. So that's mental note to check into that. It yeah. would have been nice when my, so my mom was very good at avoiding a diagnosis. Uh, my listeners know this, but for your knowledge, my grandmother had vascular dementia and my maternal great grandmother also had what they called senile dementia back in the day. She died before I was born. So nobody knows what flavor of dementia she had. So my mom knew what was coming. And we had a, a conversation one day when we had a business together and she didn't recognize her handwriting on an order she had taken that had no directions or due dates or anything useful. You know, like, am I supposed to do with this? And I asked her, I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this order for Mary? And she's like, oh, I don't know. That's so-and-so's handwriting. I mean, my heart literally just went splat on the floor because her handwriting and the employee's handwriting were not even remotely similar. And I thought, oh boy, this is bad. And I, so I told her, 
you know, I'm getting a little more concerned. You're, you used to have a couple daffy moments a week. She was like, so this was like 2003. So she was like 50, 60, she was 60. And I said, now you're starting to have them like daily. And she goes, well, I don't want to end up like my mother. And turn around, stomped off. And I was like, well, that's helpful as hell because, you know, <laughs> murder is illegal. So I don't really know how you expect me to solve for that problem. But we never had any conversations as a family as to like what, where she was at. She volunteered to, she did all the testing to donate a kidney to my dad in 2008 and was rejected for cognitive impairment. And I thought, oh, finally, we got a diagnosis. And it wasn't until after my dad passed away that I realized she wasn't diagnosed until the end of 2011. I was like, good Lord, a blind person would have known she had dementia at that point. Like, what's the point? And I had, and they lost like all her scans. And so I had to start all over. It would have been really nice if somebody had basically said, you know, we know that you, you've been part of this process, but now you're taking over. So here's what we think you should do. No, I had to figure out everything by myself. It was yeah. really not fun. Me too. And now I know there's some elder care consultants, you know, who will mm-hmm. help you make a, a game plan. And if your loved one's in the hospital, they always have social workers who are free, I think. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's so interesting when you talk about how you first noticed your mom having, you know, dementia or memory slips, because for us, the people who saw her, you know, every couple of times every week, we were completely in denial. And it was the out of town visitors who came, you know, maybe twice a year who noticed these great declines. And she was always so good at, you know, deflecting, Mm -hmm. you know, like she lost, you know, she misplaced this very special gift. Well, there's so many gifts. Christmas is such a you know, stressful time or, you know, mom, you went out to run that errand. You spent way much longer than I thought you would have, you know, which now I'm thinking she probably was lost, you know? Um, Well, I just took some time for myself. I had some other errands I needed to run, you know, and it wasn't until, what did you just say? Uh, A crazy person would have noticed she had dementia you know, blind person, a blind person, a blind person, right? I mean, I almost felt like it, it wasn't until one family dinner where you know cooking is so hard, and mm-hmm. the timing of it, the math of it, where it was just clear, like she just couldn't do any of it. And she always loved preparing big meals, but uh, anyway, it, it's interesting how people with dementia can so easily explain things and maybe because I was in denial and so wanted not to think there was a problem that I just accepted it. Well, we started, so my mom was in her, in her early fifties, back to the business. She would start. So this was back in the film days when real estate appraisers actually had to take photographs with a camera and (laughs) take them to the one hour photo place and have them printed. I used to work in the one hour photo place. That was my first job when I was 15. Yeah. Oh, wow. So it was like a photo mat? It was Fox Photo. Oh, Fox Photo. I remember those guys too. Mm -hmm. Um, We had a, so we had a photography studio and a one hour photo lab. So we did everything. We did enlargements and um, we eventually got into digital in the year 2000, which (laughs) seems like so long ago. Which there was this one, I don't know, I don't know if she chatted too much with this one gal, but we had an appraiser, really nice gal, um, to fit the photos they needed on their forms. They had to have the three and a half by five. And this was the era of, you know, bigger was better. So everybody was getting four by sixes. Mm-hmm. And to print the three and a half by five, you literally had to change the paper canister in the machine. Not complicated, not a big deal, but if 98% of your clients are getting four by six. You have to like literally make a mental note, like at X time I have to stop and run so-and-so's, you know, pictures for their appraisal. And she usually gave us like 24 hours. It wasn't, you know, it was pretty reasonable. This poor gal would walk in and be like, oh crap, we didn't do it. And that happened. <laughs> so it happened often enough because I think this gal would go out. I think she'd get the job on Monday and do the pictures on Tuesday. She'd stop by and drop it off in the afternoon. My mom was off on Wednesdays. 
And then she would come like Wednesday afternoon to pick up. And it just got to the point where she literally opened the door. That's it done. <laughs> it was so, you know, and it's like, and there was one other time. So I did a portrait of a, a really good client. They'd been around a long time. She called, she was also a real estate agent and she called and dropped more F-bombs than I've heard in a long time. And I thought, whoa, I didn't realize she spoke like this. And she'd been dealing with my mom, which apparently was just too challenging. <laughs> and so I ended up basically being a helicopter employee, you know, because if I heard my mom shooting the breeze with somebody, I'd go out there and go like, oh, so, you know, what are we doing for so-and-so today? And I would try to figure out what they'd been talking about so that I didn't have to later call and clarify <laughs> the air quotes on the clarify for people who aren't watching YouTube. It was, uh, it was stressful. And then when my dad decided somewhat abruptly, our lease was up at the end of 2005, early 2005, he's like, oh, the landlord broke the lease. We're out of here. He was not a positive guy. And I was relieved because I thought I, I knew, you know, for I'd been building up my own business in my hometown for about 18 months. So I wasn't, you know, too, too stressed out about like being unemployed, but. I was worried because I'm like, you know, my mom's got purpose and meaning here, even though a lot of the stuff she does drives me straight up the wall. She'd sweep the walk. We had trees that just dropped leaves. I swear it dropped leaves all year round and the leaves would then blow in the door. Well, you know, you prefer not to have the, in, you know, the entrance of your studio and your, your business messy. And she's literally like five minutes to opening. She's out there sweeping, 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 sweeping. <laughs> like, could we like maybe work on the orders? <laughs> Can we do something practical, please? Oh, you yeah. drive me straight up the wall. I'd have to go in the back and do my own stuff and ignore her. Now, and did thought, your oh, sorry, did no, your go mom, ahead. in addition to forgetfulness, did she go through any stages of like agitation or getting angry or getting paranoid, or, or was she pretty? Uh, she didn't have happy. paranoia that I'm aware of. Um, no, no, she was not one of those people that got the happy Alzheimer's. <laughs> It just seemed to, amp Alzheimer's seemed to amplify her personality, which, you know, she had very high expectations of me. And the only way you knew that um, she approved of what you were doing is if you overheard her telling somebody else she was proud of you, was neglected to always tell me, which was super frustrating. Oh, yeah. And it was really hard, you know, when you're taking care of somebody that's got such a life limiting disease. You know, and it's your parent, you're like, all you want to hear is like, you're doing a really good job. And like, almost nobody ever said that. And she got more, more challenging as time went on. But I know your mom had paranoia. Um, how did you guys handle that? Because that's not something, like I said, I've experienced. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Yeah, fortunately, she didn't have too much paranoia, but there were kind of two periods of time when she really did. One was there were some boxes in the garage and she made up her mind that it was me kicking her out. And those were some things. And I was kicking her out of her house and she was homeless. And she actually called people and told them, you know, Mary's 
kicking me out. I'm going to be homeless on the streets of Houston. And then the other time was after my father died, she started inventing all these things in her mind about what happened to him, you know, mm-hmm. which, and they had been married for 50 years and how he had run off with someone else. And, and, and thinking about it now, I see that I think what she was trying to do is just make sense of these facts by kind of filling in the blanks herself. And with the boxes, someone had this great idea, just label all the boxes, Jane's belongings. And then that she was very happy with that. Then she would go to the garage and she would open it and she would see boxes. And I see all these boxes. Well, they're yours, mom. Look, they say Jane's belongings. And she was labeling anything, everything anyway you know, with kind of post-its like a lot of people do. And so that, you know, evil plan forgotten, like I was no longer this like horrible child. And then with my dad, I spent a lot of time trying to explain to her what happened. And I, it was just amazing to me that she didn't remember going to the funeral, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, at all and, or the plans for the funeral or, anything really about the night that he passed away. And so for a while I was trying to explain what happened and it was, she could not comprehend it. It would, it would hurt her feelings. You know, when she was lucid enough to kind of understand what was going on, it would, it really hurt her feelings. And so finally I just said, you know, he loves you very much. He's in a safe place and he loves you. And then she was happy with that. Because, you know, I think that's all she wanted to know was that he was okay. And I was talking to someone this morning, actually, who said her dad would wake up and ask where the water buffalo were. And (laughs) apparently he grew up on a farm and they had water buffalo. He's 100 years old. Oh, Um, wow. You know, not in the U.S., somewhere else. And so for a while, this person was telling me, I was trying to explain to him how there are no water buffalo here. Like we're in Houston and you're in my house and, you know, you're thinking about the past when you were a little kid. And then finally, she just said, you know, the water buffalo had been put up, you know, because I because I guess he was worried that they had been left out and they would walk away or something (laughs) anyway. But yeah, fortunately, those were the only two times of paranoia. And she did go through a stage where she got really aggressive, which was very unusual for my mother. Because like you said, the Alzheimer's kind of amplified your mother's personality. Well, I feel that way too, except for the few bits of paranoia and the bit of time when she was being physically aggressive. And then her doctor put her on some medication, which I know is controversial, but for her, it, it helped her, it calmed her down and she was kind of back to her baseline self. We learned the hard, well, my aunt learned the hard way and I learned, thankfully, you know, we don't generally learn from other people's experiences like we should, but I learned from her. So my grandfather passed away and my grandmother went through the same thing. Your grand, you know, she was telling my aunt, you know, your father left me for another woman. And mm. my aunt would be like, no, he died. And then my grandmother would start the whole grieving process. Right. Over. That's exactly and, it. You know, and when you're confronted with, you know, no, he didn't leave you for another woman. He died. You know, is like, that's just a no win situation, really. I don't <laughs> really know. I mean... I'm not really sure what she could have said. Obviously telling her he died was bad, but my, my experience with my mom, because she was so advanced, she remembered like the first day after he died late on a Thursday night, Friday, she'd already had a hair appointment and my sister insisted on taking her shopping for new clothes, which she really did need. Um, She was wearing things that was 20 years old which wasn't really the issue, except they were like two and three sizes too big. (laughs) So it was, you know, that was what made my sister feel good. We knew she was moving to memory care. You know, there was absolutely zero reason to argue with that. Plus it gave us something to do. 
Um, but when she was in memory care, I always took her out to get her nails done or go watch children. That's the one activity I could get her to do with me is go to the park and watch children. They're like stalkers. <laughs> that's a good, that's a and good idea though. It, it, yeah. it worked. It was challenging because she would only walk behind me. I could not get her to walk elbow and elbow. Um, if I slowed down, she would slow down and, you know, people have heard this story a lot, but I was convinced that woman was going to face plant on the sidewalk. And I was going to be the evil person because I didn't let this old lady catch up. And it was always a challenge. And I had a guest, um, geez, not sure what year it was in. I think it must have been in early 23, maybe late 22. She, She heard that my mom was the oldest of four. And she's like, your mom was keeping an eye on the kids. And I'm like, well, dang, I really wish I'd known that when she was alive. (laughs) Might have done me some good. Yes. Isn't it amazing in retrospect, you know, you see things from a different angle that you just kind of wish like at that moment, Oh, I, I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me. She was taking care of the kids at all. Yeah. I mean, it just, and she watched her feet. So just like getting from point A to point B was always stressful. But then when we got to the bench to watch children or whatever, we'd go to the pool and watch, we watched, we went all over the place to watch kids. But we would be leaving memory care in this one particular day. So her room was on the opposite side of the building from the exit. She said, does, your, does my husband know where I'm at? And it was always that snarky tone of voice, which just grates on your nerves pretty quickly. And I would say, yes, mom, dad knows where we're going. You know, we get 20 feet. Does my husband know where we're going? Okay. <laughs> yes, mom. I told dad we were going to go to the park and he thought that was a great idea five times between her room and my car I was like I'm gonna stuff this woman in the trunk or I'm leaving her here I can't deal with this question and all of a sudden it was like somebody ran by and slapped me upside the head I was like I just figured out why she keeps asking me this stupid question over and over so when she asked it again my husband know where I'm at yes Chuck told me to take you out to the park to watch the kids because he thought that'd be fun did not ask me again the rest of the day. It's like, oh my God. Yeah. So once there, I realized she did not realize that she was my mother, she did not realize that who dad, you know, when I said dad, it didn't relate to her being her husband. It was just like, once I made those connections, I was like, okay. But it was really hard because she'd always go, does my husband know where I'm at? Yeah, you know, I, or where, where is my husband? Oh, um, I saw him at the rotary meeting. And he said he was going to do some errands and he'd be back later. I always had to come up with stories. And the first six months, that was hard. Because it was like, kind of be really nice to be able to reminisce about my father with my mother. But nope, we only got that once. <laughs> in typical family, I think a lot of this happens. You know, families always have important conversations in the car. You're sitting at a red light. because <laughs> no one goes, can leave. <laughs> yeah, for real. You're strapped in. <laughs> she, we were at a red light. We weren't even that far from the residence. And she looks at me and she goes, it was really sad when your dad died. Thank God we were not moving. Because so I was like, I mean, she could have just slapped me and I would have been less like stunned. And I was like, yeah, he'd been sick a long time. My dad had diabetes. Um, so I think, you know, I think he's doing better now. And, you know, I'm, I'm like scrambling because it's like, uh, um, you know, like, oh my gosh, she's acknowledging that my dad is gone, which means she knows who I am and, you know, all those connections. And it was literally like 90 seconds. And then she goes, oh, that tree is really pretty. And I'm like, well, so much for that. Yeah. (laughs) You know, it's, it's such a bizarre disease because I remember just like you said, my mother would have these flashes of memory. And when, when she would have that kind of flash, like your mom saying, it was sorry, you know, so sad when your dad died, I just had in my mind that, well, that means her brain is still there, you know, it, and I just felt like if I ask her enough questions, you know, if I remind her of enough things, it's going to come back. Like, I'm going to be able to have a moment with her where she knows who I am and I know who she is. But, and, and I kept doing that, which thinking about my lawyer background was probably not very pleasant, but she was always a good sport about it. And at the end, she always just agreed with me, I think, to shut me up. But, you know, it's hard to accept how this disease works, you know, mm-hmm. how even when you have those flashes, you can be happy for that in the moment. 
but it's just a moment. Uh, and I yeah. think that's just such a confounding thing about this illness. And that was the only time in three years that I got that other than um, right at the end, she had fallen and broken her leg. And this was literally at the start of the pandemic. So that was like real fun. Mm. And she's um, the caregiver. One of the caregivers in the residence said, you know, she'd gotten mom laughing and everything. And so I whipped out my phone to record. She was talking to my mom and my mom said something about time flying and, and, Knowing, knowing now that she was, you know, looking back at that video, it's like, I think that was kind of like a premonition. She knew she was going. Um, I don't watch it too often because it's kind of, it's tough. But, you know, in, I had that one moment about dad and that was cool. But it, like I said, it did take me a little while to figure out, you know, that I, I couldn't answer as myself. I had to be the person she thought I was. And that was tricky. Mm, you know, and you mentioned your mom falling. Mm -hmm. And that happened to me. I remember I was at work and got a call. Oof. You know, <laughs> your mother, you need to get here right away. She needs to go somewhere and get x-rays because we don't know. You know, she could have broken her hip. And fortunately, I had already planned for where would I take mom if she fell, you know? Where, where would we go? What's nearby? How would I get there? Uh, so that was really a good, you know, time saver. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing I never thought about, which I, I could have, it just didn't occur to me, was how am I going to handle, you know, as her disease progresses, progresses transportation for her, you know, because I always took her in my car. And then it got more difficult to take her in my car, but I could get her to maneuver in and put the seatbelt on. I'd put it on for her, even though she didn't know what that was. And then, you know, all of a sudden when she couldn't get out of her wheelchair to get in the car, I remember like we had a doctor's appointment and I hadn't planned for that at all. Like I, I hadn't really thought ahead to think, okay, how are we going to do that? Like, do we need a transportation company? How am I going to find that? Is that covered by insurance? So there were a few things that, you know, I, I think it's very hard to do in the moment. Um, but, but if you can take some time or maybe on the list we talked about at the beginning of your podcast, you know, you could assign to someone, um, you know, think of, you know, transportation solutions, you know, where is she going to live? You know, just kind of, what questions should we be asking the insurance company, uh, to do that kind of pre-planning? And, and one thing we did do that was very helpful was I did ask her doctor, what's next? Like, what are some things we should be thinking of as a family? Like, what are decisions that you've seen come up that are hard for people? And uh, so we had a lot of discussions about like a stomach plug um, mm. I know that's not a very, you know, cheery topic, but it was good that we had already kind of discussed that as a family so that when that came up, it wasn't, um, or, you know, what hospital she might go to, uh, if she needed to go to the hospital. So when that came up during COVID and they called me and said, she, she needs an ambulance, she needs to go to the hospital. Like, fortunately I already knew which one, um, but I like that. If I had to do it all over again, I would do the list. I would assign the people and I would have so many good questions for them. <laughs> that I would have had no clue how to ask in 2012, <laughs> 2012 well, to 2020. That's when she passed away. Passed away. Oof. Yeah. Oof. Well, we, we went through it for 20 years, but my dad did most of it. So I just had to figure out stuff for three, but the whole, what, what should I plan for? What might be coming next is the key thing that I got out of your book. And now we're like way into the show today. And I think that's what a lot of people don't do. And maybe they get, if they do ask, they get mediocre answers because obviously every human is different. Every brain yes. is different. Mm -hmm. Disease affects people differently. Mm -hmm. So answering that question is not necessarily you know, you might say, well, they might start falling and they might break a leg and be wheelchair bound. And then what are you going to do about transportation or what do you do when they're bed bound? I mean, some of those conversations we don't really want to have, but it is good to know 
that these things might be coming up. So before we get too much further into the hour here, the one thing I really wanted to ask that I have not actually talked to any guest about that I can recall, and I do have a pretty good memory, is how did you manage your career and raising your sons and caring for your mother? And obviously you're still sane because you wrote a book. So <laughs> is there like some advice you can give for people who, like me, still needed to work, wanted to work? I mean, at least I wasn't raising my daughter. She, she moved out February 1st. My dad died March 2nd. And I was like, excuse me, I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing. And I have been planning on empty nest for a long time. So (laughs) I'm going to enjoy it. Thank you. (laughs) Um, Well, the first thing I'll say about kind of the sandwich generation, or even if you're just a working parent and you have a, have a spouse is I don't think there's anybody, even if they look like everything is seamless and going perfectly well, I think everybody's struggling, especially the sandwich generation. You know, even the people, because people would say to me, oh, Mary, you look like you're just handling all of this so well, you know, and you're doing so well in your career and your kids are doing well in school. And, you know, you've got your mom over here and I would just, oh, thank you. Thank you. But, you know, really in the inside, I was like struggling a lot of the time, you know, um, so the first thing I would say is be easy on yourself, uh, because all you can do is your best. And I think when you, when you're a working person and you have small kids, I think some of those skills are a bit transferable. I mean, I hope that mm-hmm. doesn't sound offensive, but you know, you've kind of gotten used to the fact that, well, I can't go to every school event you know, so I need to kind of pick and choose and prioritize different things. And maybe you've already thought through, like I thought through, because I I think employers are more um, understanding now because we all know someone with dementia or we know someone caring for someone with dementia. But back in 2012, it, (laughs) it really wasn't, you know, talked about so much. Um, and you're in a job and you're expected to do, you know, work, you know, and, and so I think there's a tendency for some people to say, oh, of course, you know, go do whatever it is you need to do, but get your work done. Yeah. You know, I think that's just no matter where you work or who you are. Um, so I, I would say like, I, I started telling you at the beginning, I, I had actually changed jobs right before my dad died from a place where I had been for a long time to this new place that I really, really liked. But since I didn't have those relationships with people, it it was harder to say, like, I really need to take, you know, this afternoon to go look for care or, you know, I need to leave right away because my mother just fell, you know, it just didn't feel as good. So one thing I did was I went back to, my job where I had kind of more relationships. And I think honestly, that was the moment in my career. I had always had this trajectory that I wanted to follow, like my five-year plan, because (laughs) I'm just a planner. That's who I am. And I think that was the moment where I realized, you know, you, you can't, you need to change the way you're thinking about things. Not that you can't be successful, but you, you need to be for me maybe other people are different, more in the moment, you know, and it was more, I'm not going to put all this pressure on myself to achieve all these things. You know, I'm just going to really focus on doing the best job that I can in the moment and formulating good relationships with people. And ironically, I think I probably did better than I would have if I had been so rigid, you know, about following my plan. And one thing I did have was like a plan ABC for childcare because, you know, being a lawyer, I was fortunate enough to be able to afford someone who could come to our house. But what happens if, you know, that person doesn't show up that day or that person is sick or that person has a family emergency. So, you know, I had kind of backup plans and I sort of had the same for my mother. Like we had caregivers who came to the home but then I also had a backup plan that I had like vetted an agency, you know, 
So in a, in a, she didn't like the agency people at all. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, she didn't know them, you know, and it wasn't an ideal situation and she really was unhappy about it, but I knew she was safe, you know, and, and sometimes I think you have to accept, I know my mother's, you know, unhappy with me, but I also know that what I've done here is for her safety, you know? Um, but I think there are a lot of people in kind of that sandwich generation. And I do find that it's helpful if you find somebody else going through the same thing, if you can say, look, you know, could we kind of, could I put you on my list if I need somebody to pick up my kids from school, you know? Because maybe you need that while you're taking care of your mom. You know, could you do that? And I'll do that for you. You know, kind of ask around and try to form a network of different, you know, different things. And talking to other people who are in a similar situation is helpful. Now, having said that, you know, I think I probably talked to two people because I was just so busy and kind of, you know, overwhelmed with everything to do. But I think my main comment for sandwich generation caregivers is uh, just have reasonable expectations of yourself and know if you really are trying, you know, in good faith, that's the best, you know, you, you can't fault yourself if you're trying your best and some things are going to slip. I mean, they are. And there were a lot of times when like, it, it was obvious, you know, instead of the cane, mom needed a walker, you know, and, and people would come and have lunch with her and say like, well, Mary, why doesn't she have a walker? Like she's a walker. Like she has a cane. And I would think, oh my gosh, like, why didn't I notice that? And I'm like, terrible. (laughs) But, you know, there are a lot of things during the disease that you, you don't really notice until it's really necessary, especially if you're balancing a lot of things. Um, and just try to be easy on yourself. And one of the things that I realized is the, um, the, the changes and the progression can be very subtle. And so it's kind of like when somebody in your household or yourself is losing weight, like you don't really notice it until you realize like, wow, this shirt's way too big. And then you look in the mirror and you're like, yeah, I guess I have lost weight. I love that analogy. That's so true. I never thought about it like that, but that's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's, you know, it's, I mean, we don't notice that our hair is growing until you get to the, you know, a few days before the hair appointment, you're like, dang, I think I got a hair appointment this week. So it's just, when you think about it that way, you know, it was really easy to dismiss my mom's, you know, not writing down the due date for this poor, you know, uh, real estate appraisers film because, you know, she was busy. The phone rang, she had to go to the bathroom, all of the above, you know, just stuff happens. You don't think that somebody at, 53 years old having memory issues and it just it wasn't until it became chronic and worse that it was like you know when she stopped recognizing her own handwriting it was like that's like a a bat upside the head and so you know yeah you feel badly but it's like you know it's it's really easy to dismiss and you know I don't know anybody that kind of immediately jumps to oh my god they must have Alzheimer's right (laughs) who does that? that Yeah, Yeah. you know, there were two other things I did, if I may, wanted to mention about my book, because Mm -hmm. they were big, big learnings for me. And the first is palliative care and hospice care, because I always was under the impression that hospice care was, you know, when you're days away from death. Uh, But for Alzheimer's, uh, you can qualify earlier. Um, And there are some hoops you have to jump through to get it kind of renewed. But hospice care is for the caregiver, it's for the patient, and they just have a lot of good information. And palliative care is before hospice care, and they don't, you know, change your medications or anything. It's, it may not be covered by your insurance, but I wish I had looked into that. Uh, Because when I did put my mom on hospice care, it was probably three or four days before she passed away. And I discovered that like half the floor was on hospice care. (laughs) and Like I had no idea, you know, and they were in the building. Uh, And then the other thing I wanted to mention is legal documentation, because it's if you're able to do it, it's so helpful and so important to try to get 
the appropriate legal documentation in place before your loved one loses that mental capacity. Um, because when you need it, it's going to be too late because they won't yep. have the requisite like mental capacity to legally be able to enter into those agreements. And I interviewed several people and asked them because a lot of people living with dementia, they don't want to sign those documents. They nope. don't want to sign a power of attorney. You know, they don't want to sign the healthcare documentation. So I did really make an effort to talk to other people about how did you, you know, how did you convince your dad to sign that? Or what, let's think about what are some ideas? Like what's a script? Like what are some different approaches that maybe people could use to try to get those things in place? So I did just want to mention those two, um, those two things. No, that's super important. And the script for how to get them to agree to signing the documentation is definitely a great idea. My parents had a, a living trust. And so that took care of a lot of stuff. And my husband and I have one as well. And so you make all those decisions and, you know, it, it actually was a relief when we did it. You know, it's kind of like, oh, okay, that wasn't quite as bad as I expected it. The, the biggest question was, because we only have one child, was what would happen with our estate if she passed away first? You know, would we give it to her husband or, you know, whatever, you know. And the amazing amount of mental gymnastics one does when faced with that kind of, you know, first off, I told the attorney that that was a really rude question. <laughs> That's not cool. I don't like that question. And then I was thinking about it and, you know, my son-in-law comes from a family that's very poor and there's just a lot of dysfunction. And, you know, you can like mentally make up all these like what ifs. And one day I was coming down the stairs and I thought, I'll be dead. I won't care. <laughs> and so I told him, I'm like, if I have to come back and haunt you, because you let your family do some stinky stuff with you and on the money you get from us, that's going to happen. And that was the end of it. It's like, geez, you know, I'm like, do all this mental gymnastics, what if, and it's like, I'll be dead. I won't care if, you know, he's an adult. If he lets them manipulate him out of an inheritance that, you know, my daughter has um, an autoimmune disease. So it is possible she could go first, not a hundred percent likely because he is five years older, but it's like, I won't care. You know, I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> and it's, I think just letting go of a lot of that, you know, just, you really won't care. Just don't, don't stress yourself out about stuff you have no control over. Yeah. And, and don't get upset if you read these documents and they make no sense because <laughs> I think elder care law is complicated, you know, and, and I'm a lawyer, but even some of my, my parents gave me a manila envelope, like in, you know, 2009 or something and said here, like we kind of had a discussion about you know, what would happen if they passed. And, and when I finally, I never opened the envelope, like, why would I open the envelope? I don't know. But when I finally did open it, you know, it was at a time when I was, it was so emotionally charged. Um, it was helpful to have somebody just, you know, let me make sure I understand this because some of the language is a bit archaic or medical, you know, um, so don't feel bad if you don't, understand that. And like you, I recently put, I renewed all my documentation and I felt terrible. Nobody, you don't want to think about your mortality, you know? So anyway, but it well, is important. Well, my paternal grandmother lived to be 103. Wow. And since I inherited negative family genes from her side of the family, most specifically the fat gene, <laughs> I've said, Okay, well, I better not have inherited the bad brain gene from mom's side of the family because that's going to be, I was going to be a reckoning when I go. Um, so I'm like, I'm just going to live to be 103 like her. And I'm going to, my mind will be fine. And so that means everybody's got to put up with me for another 46 years, 46 and a half. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's, we're all going to die. It's fine. Live your, live the life as best you can. Do the best job you can, be as happy as you can, and don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> Just boiled the whole episode down into one sentence. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> it's not easy to do that, though. I'm, no, I'm a planner, it's hard. and I hate it when I make plans, and 
you know, other people disrupt those plans or, you know, life disrupts those plans. It just makes me crazy. But I'm just trying to learn. The pandemic helped me learn that, you know, it's okay. Just roll with it. I'm getting better at rolling with it. <laughs> maybe, maybe by the time I'm 103, I'll be really zen. <laughs> This has been fantastic. Let me show the book for the, the YouTube folks. There we go. So it's The Gap Between Loving and Supporting Somebody with Alzheimer's. It's definitely a book you're going to want to pick up because like we said earlier, it is memoir, but there's also really actionable tips and you're going to need them. So thank you so much for joining me. I hope everybody, I hope the book is a big success big success. Easy for me to say. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you for having me. This has been so much fun. And it was great, great, um, you know, talking to you and learning a little bit about your mom too. Well, it's how she, her legacy is going to continue forever because once things are on the internet, I don't think you can ever claw them back. So (laughs) So she's out there forever, whether Mm -hmm. she likes it or not. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.